Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Vincenzo Buongiorno, PhD student here at the University of Manchester in Dr. Curioni and Professor Joe Group, and I'm glad to present my talk evaluating coating performance by electrochemical and physical spectroscopy combined with neural network. So during my presentation, I'll give you a uh, first uh, introduction of my project with the context and aim. Then I'll show you some preliminary study I did with simulated data, and then uh, I'll use the neural network tool to, as a case, to, to analyze a case of study from intact coating systems, and then I'll prove if my model is valid enough with, uh, with new data. And at the end, I'll summarize some conclusion. So let's start with, my, with the first section. Uh, so the context is about corrosion testing. So the most uh, commonly used uh, corrosion tests rely on exposing a material in, uh, to a certain environment, and uh, usually it's based on a pass or fail criterion. This is uh, uh, for, for sure easy to perform, but it is limited somehow because it doesn't give any information about the failure or mechanistic understanding of the system. On the other hand, we can use electrochemical testing like, uh, like this one, and the focus of, in this presentation is about EIS, electrochemical impedance spectroscopy. So these are, uh, can, can provide quantitative information about the system we study, but the complexity limits its application, especially in industrial fields. Why? Because uh, it is necessary first to choose an equivalent electric circuit which physically represents the system, and then we have to fit the data, which means we have to find the numerical values of the uh, electrical equivalent circuits which contain information about uh, corrosion. So uh, the idea, the proposal was to uh, make this process easier. Why don't we use neural network or machine learning? So in machine learning, we have uh, a neural network, in my case, uh, data, and there is a training process. And once we train, we have the model trained, we can use it for new data to get some uh, knowledge and results. So for those of you who are not familiar with machine learning, I hope this slide can be uh, helpful. So let's suppose I want to teach a computer to distinguish between a horse and a dog. So what I can do is I can write a huge code, including all the features dis distinguishing the horse and the dog. And at the end, the computer is able to understand because it follows a pattern, a path I wrote for it. The drawback is that if a certain feature is not included in the, in the, in the data, in the, in the code, then the computer is not able to interpret it. With the machine learning approach, on the other hand, we give to the neural network a lot of uh, data, and then during a training process, it learns itself how to distinguish. So now it's the computer is able to handle new data because it has learned itself based on the data I gave it. How can this be applied to EIS? So uh, this slide uh, shows some examples. The, exa the first example is classification, in which I have my EIS spectrum, and I give it to the neural network. So for classification, the machine learning, the neural network has to assign a category. The category could be related to, uh, as I mentioned before, the appropriate equivalent circuit to use for fitting, for example, or maybe the performance of, a, of a, a system. I will show you, I'll show you this later. And the second, the second example is fitting. In this case, I already know the equivalent circuit to use to represent the system, and the neural network will give me the numerical values of, the, of, of that system, which again, are important to obtain information about our system. So, uh, in this section, I will try to uh, see if it's feasible to study EIS with neural network. So, uh, to overcome the limitation of initial data availability, the proposal was, well, why don't we start with simulated data? So, this will remove any limitation of data availability. So, how we know the impedance Z is a function of the frequency and the numerical values of the electrical circuit parameters. 
So I can input the frequency, the type of circuit I want to model, and the values of the equivalent circuit into a, a, calculate, a software which can calculate for me the impedance modules and phase shift. The impedance modules and phase shift because, they, because impedance is a complex number, so I have modules and phase shift. And then I can gather all this information and I can give this information to machine learning. So for example, I give the frequency, the modulus, and the phase shift as an input for the machine learning. And then what I want to know, so what the machine learning will tell me is, okay, maybe the component of the equivalent circuit, which is the output for the fitting problem, for example, or the type of circuit, which is an output for, an output for a classification problem. So what I do, I have the neural network, I simulate data sets, and I train. And then I use uh, another bunch of uh, unseen data to see if machine learning has really uh, learned. So the first uh, case I want to study is a classification. So in this case, the machine learning has to identify if uh, the EIS response is coming from this, this, or this for scenario one. There is another scenario in which the EIS response comes from this, this, or this circuit. So a way I have to measure the ability of machine learning for this task is accuracy, which means how many right predictions the machine learning uh, does over the total amount of prediction. This is what appeared in the y-axis here. On the x-axis, I, uh, I have the how many data I use for the training. So I train the machine learning with 10 data, 100, 1,000, 50,000. What you can see is the machine learning is uh, able to uh, interpret uh, with an accuracy of almost 100% for the first scenario after two, around 200 data, and uh, the, the same for the, uh, the more difficult scenario but with uh, a lower accuracy because the, the, the task is more difficult. I can do the same thing for fitting. In this case, I have uh, an example of EIS spectrum fitted with a machine learning train with 25, 100, and uh, 200 examples. So what fitting means is we have the dot here, which is the data, the representation of the data, and what we want is that the, the, the red curve overlaps the data. So you see when I use a quite uh, big data set, uh, the, 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 the result, the performance I achieve are quite satisfactory. So, in this section, I showed you that machine learning can be potentially employed for EIS, so the problem is well posed. And what I want to do now is I want to use this tool to study a real, uh, real data, experimental data from, from a real system. And the system I study is an organic coating, uh, a, a, a model epoxy mine coating, uh, with a certain formulation of pigment inside. And what we did, if we vary the, the pigment volume concentration, it, it means how many pigments in volume I have in my coating from 0% to 40%. So what the aim, here the aim is really to uh, have a large data set with different behaviors to study with neural network. So all the epoxy mine coated panels were provided by our industrial partner, Axon Nobel, and were uh, applied in uh, aluminium and uh, steel. We exposed the panel to two different electrolytes. As I mentioned, we varied the PVC. So we have a lot of variables. We have two substrates, two electrolytes, uh, five PVC percentage. We continuously monitor the system, and at the end we end up with a lot of EIS spectra, and the images of the coatings and the images after the stripping. So what I can do is after the test, I can look at the coating, at the systems, and in some cases, you see I light it with a red frame, we have visible signs of corrosion with blisters, I mean, or rust coming out. So I, I assign these uh, coating systems a red frame. Uh, so let's focus on the red frame specimens. When I remove the coating, I do see signs of corrosion. There is another category, like the green one, in which when I remove the coating, there, are, there is no corrosion or very, slightly, uh, very slight corrosion signs. But there is another uh, third category, 
So for example, let's see these specimens here, in which there is no visible defect, but when we remove the coating, there is corrosion. So you see that I'm able to classify uh, the specimens at the end of the test in three main categories. And this seems a classification problem to study with neural network. So the, the question I can ask machine learning is, okay, I'll, I'll show you the spectrum, and I want, you, I want the machine learning to identify the right category associated to that spectrum. And let's see if machine learning has more or less learned. So again, what I kept into account was accuracy and also precision and recall. I'll not, ex I'll not go too far in the details of precision and recall, but they are used to help me to understand what is, which is the category that machine learning uh, struggles to, uh, or is the best to identify. So uh, this table here reports all the results. We see uh, we high have uh, all the numbers above 80%, except maybe for uh, class M, which, is, which means it's the most difficult one to interpret. Why? Because sometimes it has behavior more similar to class G, sometimes it has behavior more similar to class B, so it makes sense. So in this uh, last section, I showed you that I used this tool to interpret data from a real from real systems. But someone could argue and say that I only studied one system. It's true. So what I want to do now is validate if the model is able to understand, to interpret other kind of data, or other data from slightly different systems. So that's why I'm gonna, that's what I'm gonna show you now. So the, the coating was the same one, but we varied the uh, pigments formulations so big, different pigments, I cannot tell you more about that, but they are uh, different pigments gives different uh, behaviors. So that's why we vary these pigments. And we, we apply the coating on, the, on aluminum and steel, and we expose to these electrolytes. So also in this case, I can, with the same criterion, I can uh, classify the data. Unfortunately, I don't have any class N, but again, the concept behind is more or less the same. But with uh, keeping, into, uh, keeping in mind that I'm now, before I trained the machine learning, I trained the, the neural network with data from, based on the data from a, cert, a certain system, and now I'm using the same, uh, the same neural network with slightly different data. That's why, that's because I really want to validate if the model is good enough. But, Basically, the question I'm asking is always the same. Is, is this, this spectrum for, for class G, M, or P? And again, this is how I uh, um, measure the performance. So it's the same metrics to be consistent with the previous uh, uh, case of study. Also in this case, the, uh, all the metrics are uh, quite satisfactory. And you can see again that uh, I have 100% precision and precision here, which means the machine learning is when it says P, a G or P, it's quite confident it is a G or P. But again, since these are a bit lower, it means that it maybe is a bit confused with this plus in the middle. So finally, I can conclude this talk. So in the second section, I show you, I showed you that uh, machine learning, neural network, and machine learning in general. Uh, can be used to uh, study EIS, and we did this with simulated data. In the, second, in the third section, I showed you that uh, it can be used as a tool to study, for example, coating systems, uh, and the, the, the accuracy obtained was quite uh, satisfactory. And then the same model was used in the uh, fourth and last session, section to interpret data from slightly different system and uh, validate it's, it's, uh, uh, if it's solid to interpret data from different systems. I, uh, I want now to thank you all for your kind attention, and I want also to uh, uh, thank Axel Nobel for the financial support and APSRC. Um, are there any questions?
And can you clarify for me what your input data to the network is? Is it, is it a whole string of input values corresponding to all the different frequencies? Yes, yeah, so there's a, there's a frequency, and uh, for each frequency, the associated modulus and phase shift. But is that, one, is that one input into the network for each frequency, or is it a whole set of inputs for a whole set of frequencies? Uh, you can see it as an array, like it, there is an array of frequency. Yeah. From, you, know, you know, I can decide the frequency range I, I want to, to yeah. analyze. So it's an array of frequency with an array of modulus and an array of phase shift. So that corresponds to one data point, one train of element. That's an example. Then I have all the results. So one example consists of an array of frequency, okay. an array of models, and array of phase shift. So it's the whole spectrum. Then I have several spectra. You must have a very big network to cope with that. You must have a very big network to cope with that many inputs. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, the, 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 the newer network was. Uh, was Made, like, the, the architecture was chosen by a bit of trial and error, but of course it can be optimized. But what's your the question I have? How the degrees of freedom in the network uh, too large compared to the number of training points that you have? So that, that, will, that will worry me if it is a model like this. Uh, well, of course, I think you you need. Mathematically, there, there could be a solution to that. Uh, of course, as, as soon as you have enough data, but the thing is, the neural network doesn't know the function. So, yeah, it's right that it, it's important to keep into account the degree of freedom of the system, but you, we need also to keep into account that the, the neural network doesn't know the function a priori. It optimizes the function. I'll talk to you after this. It's yeah. complicated questions I want to ask you. <laughs> Maybe a more simple question. Yeah. Um, is, I think you have also intrinsically false measurements, meaning that the impedance was not correctly measured or due to bad contact or maybe the coating was uh, bad and it was not good applied or something like that. Is that something you take out uh, out of your training set? Or the, is that in the training set? No, the, I, I kept in the training sets because I think it's, but this is a good point. So I can actually try to train also with, uh, with only clean data or with data with some noise. But I think it's important because uh, in, in, in a real data set, like if you look at uh, an industrial application of these, you have a lot of data. So clearly look at all those data, it's a bit impractical. So, but that, it's, that's a good point, so to check and, and do uh, and put some noise in the data on purpose and see how it, how it behaves. That's a good point. So when you talk about the accuracy of, of the model, I, I presume it's just selecting one of these three conditions. And does that mean that it doesn't, it, just selects the wrong one, or it doesn't know what the correct answer is? No, it, it always selects uh, uh, something, but sometimes it selects the wrong one. It's like when you have a student in an exam with like multiple choices, so it, it will eventually answer something, but maybe it's not the right one. And so why don't you have another option where it can't select any of those So for example, in, in uh, it's a bit uh, different. So in, in classification problems, it will never say you this is the right answer. It gives a probability for each answer. So then you select the one with a higher probability. Well, thank you very much, Vincenzo.